This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Aquarium Mania. I'm your host, Dr. Roy Anong, speaking to you from the University of Florida's Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. Thanks for joining us. Many beautiful aquarium fish come from the Amazon, but one of the most iconic is the discus. Known as the king of aquarium fish, discus have a reputation for being difficult to keep. But are they? Our guest today, Gabriel Posada, has been breeding and raising discus for many years at Jack Watley Discus. Join us as Gabe shares his knowledge and stories of discus and the aquarium pioneer Jack Watley. We'll be right back after these messages. Put on a perfectly possum pet party. Having an awesome birthday or adoption day celebration for your four-legged friend? Or just want a fun excuse to throw a fun party with your friends from the dog park? Deck out your party with Molly and Bandit Pet Party Accessories, party products designed specifically for pets. There are wearables, including adjustable pet party hats, bow ties, and tutus. The photo prop kits include funny glasses and hats. The party supplies and decorations include coordinating table covers, party banners, cake decorations and treat bowls, cups, and bags. Everything you need to create great memories and Instagram-worthy photos. They're available in two colorful themes, Tropical and Fireman. It's a dog's life. Celebrate it with Molly and Bandit Pet Party at mollyandbanditpetparty.com slash petlife. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. My guest today is Gabriel Posada of Jack Watley Discus. Hi, Gabe. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Roy. Nice to be here. So uh, I always like to ask some uh, personal questions, you know, nothing too personal before we, we start talking about the uh, topic at hand. Where are you from originally? Originally born in Cuba. I was there till I was about nine years of age, and then we migrated to the U.S. Uh, my dad decided that New Jersey would be the place to uh, find better work, and so we went up to New Jersey. I was up there from 1970 till about the end of 1991 when I moved down to Miami. And what was your very first fish in aquarium setup, if you remember that far back? Well, I remember back when I was about four or five years of age that uh, I had some cousins who lived out in the countryside. We lived in the city. We lived in Havana. And uh, I would go visit them on the weekends. And I remember we had those uh, one-gallon pickle jars, the glass jars. And we would go to a little ravine that ran behind their house and uh, actually catch wild guppies. And uh, I remember we kept them for years. We bred them and the whole nine yards. And it's funny, when I think back about it, you think a pickle jar, you know, no filtration, no aeration, no nothing. We would literally use chalk and put in chalk into the thing, and, you know, the air bubbles would come out of the chalk, and that would aerate the water. Once it became saturated, we'd just stick our hands in the jar, pull the chalk out, and let it dry again, and do this over and over again. And when you think about it, that was pretty ingenious. And don't ask me how we came up with that, but did, we never killed a single guppy. They actually bred, and we would throw them back in the ravine. And all through my life, I've always, 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 for some reason, had fish tanks. That's great. Uh, yeah, I never actually heard the chalk one. That's pretty interesting. I mean, I have to... Yeah, as a matter of fact, to... you know, it's funny. Jack once asked me, he says, how did you keep them alive? Because they were obviously you know, a pickle jar has no aeration or nothing. And I told him about the chalk, and he said to me, Gabe, that's ingenious. That's amazing. And, and, and what's more ingenious is we knew that once it became saturated, it would last about five minutes. You had to take it out and put it on the side. We'd leave it out in the sun. It would dry out, and then just put another piece in. That's and on funny. and on and on, the cycle went. So how did you first become interested in discus? Well, in 1983, I had a 55-gallon tank in my house. And uh, I remember going to New York one time, and they told me about this big pet shop. For the life of me, I can't remember the name of it. But I went in, and I looked around, and the place was humongous. And uh, it was one of the biggest places I had ever been to. And while w walking in the back, the owner asked me if I had ever seen wild discus. And to be honest with you, I had heard of them. I had never seen them. 
Uh, he took me in the back, showed me a tank filled with wild discus, and I was absolutely blown away, not just because of the way the fish looked, but because of the attention. I mean, to me, they, they didn't act like fish. They acted more like dogs. They were following me around. I guess they were hungry, the whole nine yards. Bottom line is I became infatuated with them, and I took about six of them home. I don't even remember how many hundreds of dollars back then I spent. And I actually kept them. For quite a few years, I had a, a freshwater stingray, which in New Jersey are legal. Here in the state of Florida, they're not. And everybody thrived together. I actually enjoyed them for many, many years. Unfortunately, I went through a divorce, and I had to get rid of the tank and the whole nine yards. So one thing led to another. I moved down to Florida. In 1991, I decided I'm going to set up a big discus tank. And, uh, you know, lo and behold... The rest is history. I Tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about um, well, how that What happened was I set up the tank. I, I, so I went from a 55-gallon. I decided to have a custom-made 125, and I set that up. And to be honest with you, I, I wasn't thinking about this, cause, but one day I was at a pet shop, and there just happened to be a copy of a magazine, Tropical Fish Hobbyist, laying on the counter. And while the owner was looking for something, I don't remember, I thumbed through it, and all of a sudden I realized that Jack Watley was living in Fort Lauderdale, and that's like a 20-minute drive from Miami. So I said, let me write this number down. I called him up. I remember him saying to me, you know, call me before you come. You have to make an appointment. I set it up. I went up to see him. And you have to remember, the only thing I had ever seen was either the Browns, the Wilds, and sometimes, in pictures, I would see the Watley turquoise. But, you know, you couldn't get those back then. They were very difficult to get. Well, when I walked in and I saw the first, which were the pigeon bloods, which had reds, yellows, black spots on them, which nowadays we don't like the black spots. But I was mesmerized. I mean, literally mesmerized. And I remember that I bought six from him. And this is a funny story. He charged me $225 for all six. They must have been probably about the size of a 50-cent piece. And, and, you know, we became partners later on. And I always tell him, hey, Jack, you know, you got to give me back that money. And he always shrugs it off and says, no, nah, that's water under the bridge. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's so, funny. But it's just a funny little uh, conversational piece. But nonetheless, you know, I uh, set up the tank for them. I, I put them in there, and it was six discus, and they grew and grew, and, and, you know, I got the recipe from him on how to do the beef heart, and I would make a tremendous mess in the kitchen making that beef heart. It would stink to this day. It still stinks. And I actually raised them and raised them. And I remember in 1992, like towards the end of 92, a year and a half later, I was sitting down in front of the tank. I believe I was playing dominoes with some of my parents' friends or something, and I noticed that the discus were shivering in the tank. And the first thing was, holy crap, the uh, heater must have gone. You know what I mean? Because they're shaking. I'm saying that the water must be cold. I got up, I lifted the lid, I put my hand inside, the water was warm. And I'm seeing all these discus shaking everywhere. Well, the very next day, I had a breeding pair on the left-hand side of the tank. I had a breeding pair in the middle of the tank. And I had a breeding pair on the right side of the tank. And all three spawned on the same day. That's awesome. And That's, it blew yeah. me away because, I mean, what are the odds of six discus, three breeding pairs? Yeah, that's great. Okay. So one thing led to another. Just to make a long story short, nobody knew anything. I didn't know anything about breeding, okay? Never once had it dawned on me, let me call Jack Watley and ask him for information because I had spoken to other people, and they told me, you know, once Jack sells you the fish, he doesn't want to know anything about you. And for some reason, <laughs> that stuck to me. It was like, I don't want to bother the man. I don't want to get him annoyed at me or whatever. So instead of doing that, what I did was there was no internet back then. So I had to start making long distance calls. And Roy, I'm going to be honest with you. Some of my bills were about $350 a month on long distance calls where I was calling other breeders around the nation, around the world, trying to gather information. And unfortunately, and even to this day, most of that information is taboo. Nobody wants to give away their secrets. They don't want any competition. You know what I mean? They don't want Joe Schmo and next door to them breeding discus just like they do, which to me is sacrilege because you really need to educate people so that more people become more interested in the discus. And so so the what happened? Did you, did you get the information? Well, what happened was I, I would call one guy and make believe I was going to buy some discus from him, and he would give me a little piece of the jigsaw puzzle, but not the complete thing. I would call another guy, and I would try to deviate from the information I already had, gathering other information. And then finally, I was able to put enough of that information together to go out and spend thousands of dollars on reverse osmosis, deionization units to soften the water, 
pH meters. I mean, at the beginning, I bought uh, ridiculous Hanna pH meters. They were about $400 each, which re realistically, they're laboratory meters. You don't really need them that technical. But nonetheless, you don't know. You spent. So I have a two-bedroom, two-bath condo on the beach in Miami, and that's where the, the uh, original hatchery started in one of the bedrooms. Okay. So And uh, what happened was the three breeding pairs started producing, and... Uh, a year later, their offspring started getting large and started pairing off on their own. And before you know it, inside one of the bedrooms, there were 18 breeding pairs going. Wow. So were you selling these also or did you? Uh, were you yeah, I was going to the local pet shops at the beginning. And to be honest with you, you know, it was a hobby. So I right. figured, listen, if I need an air pump or if I need food or if I need tubing, you know, I'll, I'll trade some of the discus in and buy that stuff from the local pet shops. So let's fast forward to uh, to Jack then. So when you um, when did you decide to start well, working? Well, the funny Jack? part is, he called so. me. He called me in 1993, and uh, and I was surprised because he called me, and he said to me, Gabriel, uh, I don't know if you remember me. It's Jack Watley from Fort Lauderdale, and I said, Yes, I do remember you, Jack. And he said to me, Gabe, I have a little dilemma, and I'm going to be very honest with you. I keep a ledger of the sales that I do, the names of people, what fish they bought from me. I keep everything on record. And what happened was a raccoon got into my fish room and startled the breeding pair of red pandas, like the ones that I sold you, right out of the tank, literally ate the female. The, the male, I found them dead on the floor. I no longer has that strain, and I didn't have any babies because at that time he was selling a lot of them. They were the newest craze. So he said to me, I see here on my ledger that you're the only local guy that ever bought that strain from me, and I was just wondering if you would sell me back, if you still have them, the original uh, discus you bought from me. They must be large now, and I'm willing to pay you more. The whole spiel. Right. I said, well, you're Jack, you just happened to call me at the right time, because here I am sitting on about 350 of those, and I don't know what to do with them. And I remember him asking me on the phone, why, Gabriel, did you go out and buy 350 of those fish? And I told him I didn't buy them, I bred them. And, you know, there was a hesitation on the phone, Roy. And I could be, I swear to you, Jack didn't believe me. Right away, he said, listen, what are you doing this Saturday? This was a Wednesday. What right. are you doing this Saturday? And I said, I'll be here at the house if you want to come by. All right, I'll see you Saturday. And I remember he came in, he shook my hand, and he said, where's the fish room? Walked right into the bedroom, walked in. I walked right behind him. He looked all around, didn't say a word turned around to me and said, I've been all over the world. I've been to so many hatcheries around the world. I have never in my life seen so many discus in such a small room. But I was in there three times a day doing water changes, feedings. The day Jack came to see me, all 18 breeding pairs were loaded with babies. And I had about maybe 300 in all different sizes throughout the bottom tanks. And then he asked you to be partners with him, pretty much? No. What he did was he said to me, Gabriel, here's a check. And he gave me a blank check signed. And he said to me, all these fish are mine. I didn't understand what he was saying, but I said, Jack, I think you're, you're jumping the gun. These are my fish. If you're willing to buy some from me, I'll be more than happy to sell them. He said to me, that's exactly what I was trying to say. So he ended up taking all the adults that I, I had too many of. He ended up taking all the small ones and started selling and selling and selling them. And I remember he would come down every two weeks, every week, depending on how many orders, he would come down with his little buckets to pick up fish and stuff. And like on the third trip, instead of coming with empty buckets, he started coming with some of his own breeding pairs. And he would say to me, here, Gabriel, try your luck out with these turquoise, try your luck out with these cobalts. And, you know, Roy, Jack Watley bringing me his breeding pairs is like, you know, the Florida lottery coming to your door and saying you won without playing. Exactly. Yes. You know, back then it was exciting for me. It was very exciting for me. But in the same, in the same run, what, what he was doing was he was pushing the business onto me. He saw that I had a lot of interest. Nobody in his family was interested. Right. Back then, Jack was already in his 70s. So he, he needed somebody to help him out. We right. did this all the way through 1995, at which time I got the infamous phone call of Gabriel. It'll be a long winter in hell the next time i come down to miami i don't want to come down there anymore to pick up any more fish i'm giving you an ultimatum either you quit your job and open up a big hatchery and run with the business or i'm closing down the shop and so uh, basically i had to, a lot to think of because you don't just quit your job and, and start a new business you don't know where you're going you know i had a lot of thought process so in order to make it easy for me he invited me over to the house 
And uh, I remember he pulled out that ledger of the sales that he had where he had found my name again. And, and I remember he flipped it open to the last page, turned it around and slid it across the table and, you know, said to me, you see that uh, number on the bottom? And I said, yes. And he said to me, half of that could be yours. And I remember just being a wise ass, as I usually am, and I looked at him and I said, Jack, could you tell me something? Whose phone number is this? Nice. Because of all the digits. He had done something right. like $425,000 that year or something like right. that in sales. And so I said to myself, I'm wasting my time working for electronic stores, making maybe 50000 I could be doing what I love and, you know, helping this man out. And at the same time, he's helping me out. And long story short, March of 1997, I opened up the hatchery. The rest is history. So I, I wanted to maybe touch on a couple things real quick where, you know, we have to take a break shortly and um, we'll have 15 okay. minutes after roughly. But a little bit about discus now. So how many different species of discus are there? In, uh, there uh, scientifically, there are three. And they're all from the Symphysis and Genius. And the best way, without going into scientific names, it would be the browns would be one variety, the greens would be another, and then the third would be the heckles. Okay. Now, I would be the first to tell you that there's a fourth, but we're not going to get into that because the pigeon bloods are definitely a different strain altogether. But those were raised in captivity. They're hybridized. So realistically, nobody's going to take those into account. But there are three Great. registered geniuses. Yes. And um, can you describe in the wild, I guess, in the Amazon, what their water quality is like? Yeah. Most people think they come from the Amazon River itself, and they don't. They, they usually form in little lakes and tributaries that form on the sides of the river where there is no running water. They do not like running water. So obviously there... The pH and temperature is going to be different from a running stream. There, the water gets extremely hot. And uh, discus absolutely thrive between 84 and 88 degrees water temperature. They absolutely love it. The higher you go, the faster they grow, the more they eat, the more active they become. The lower you go, the opposite happens. The pH levels, they range anywhere from 5.5 all the way up to 7.5, and they will adapt. And that's what we try to tell our customers. Whatever the pH is coming out of your tap, when you do your water changes, do nothing to alter it because it's the abrupt changes that mess up the discus. The uh, pH burns. Go ahead. Yeah, another quick question. Um, I know you you guys have done a lot of different varieties, but just in general, I mean, I, I have no idea what the number is like. How many different varieties of discus are, are there, both kind of that you, you have produced with Jack or in total? There's 22 varieties that we work with, and worldwide there's over 50. Okay. Unfortunately, we can't get our hands on all of them because sometimes when these new strains come out, a breeding pair could easily cost you $100,000. Wow. That's yes. a lot of money. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so what would be the top five varieties for you that well, uh, people right like? Right now, the top five varieties that sell the best are the spotted ones like the leopards. Uh, now, the leopard varieties, now you have them white leopards, yellow leopards, the original blue leopards, which is a blue fish with red spots all over the body rather than striations. Same thing goes with the yellows, the whites, and so on and so forth. That would be the number one seller. Then the Marlboro Reds, which are the solid red pigeon bloods with the yellow face. A lot of the other breeders call them melons. Third after that would more than likely be the turquoise strains, the striated reds, turquoise, things like that. The solid yellows, for some reason, have also gained uh, notoriety. A lot of people are after them. They look a lot like the saltwater yellow tanks. And then the original strains that Wally created 60 years ago, the original cobalt, turquoise. I mean, we get orders from the original strains all the way from Japan where they want the original bloodline Wow. still today. Yeah, that's what made the business is once we went on the Internet, the world found us. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, the, the first year we opened up the website, which was in 1997, the end of 97, the first order that came in three days after the website went up was from Russia. Wow, that's a, quite a long shipment. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Tell that to a nervous guy who was uh, dealing in uh, electronics and now doing tropical fish and dealing with customs and fish and wildlife and, you know, the uh, vets to get the health certificates all in order. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But you know what? It was part of the growing pains. And uh, luckily, nowadays, everything is smooth, very smooth. Well, I want to definitely talk to you a lot more about keeping discus, and maybe we can touch a little bit about breeding, but let's take a short break, and we'll continue our discussion with Gabe Posada of Jack Wiley Discus after these messages from our sponsors. It's 
It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Dot com. <laughs> We're back and continuing our conversation with my guest, Gabe Posada of Jack Watley Discus. So Gabe, that pretty, really interesting story on how you got involved you know, with Jack. And uh, I wanted to touch a little bit now on the fish itself to you know, try to get some of our listeners really interested. I know some, a lot of people are familiar with them. A lot of them are afraid of them, really, because yeah. they've got a reputation. In your opinion, are, are they hard to keep? No, they're not. They're not. But unfortunately, when you go to a pet shop, and the pet shop doesn't have discus, so they don't carry discus, so they've had discus in the past and killed them, the first line that they're going to give you is don't go into discus because they're very difficult to keep. And, and that in, in itself is a fallacy because discus are very hardy fish. They will give you indicators out the wazoo that something's wrong before they die. They're not that like the regular tropicals where one day they're swimming, the next day they're upside down. These guys will literally give you indicators. They'll get the uh, cloudy eyes when the ammonia levels are too high. They will uh, pinch their fins when the bacterial levels are too high. Uh, they'll hide in corners and not eat when they have internal parasites. But you've got to know the indicators and you've got to know what to do. The number one problem that I see immediately is that people assume that this fish, like any uh, tropical fish, can live in any kind of temperature, and they cannot. A lot of people will put them in tanks where the temperature is 78 degrees, and the discus will just wither away and die. Basically, they'll slow down their metabolic rate and just stop eating. And that's usually what happens in pet shops. Uh, you know, the pet shops are nice and air-conditioned for the customers to walk in, and you walk in and see a discus tank, and there isn't a single heater inside the tank. And they're wondering why they're hiding behind the sponge filter, turning black, you know what I mean, just not right. eating that. Uh, and that's the problem right there on its own. If you don't know how to take care of them, yes, they will die. But once you find out all the information, once you get all your research, once you follow the guidelines, which are basic, I mean, the way that I tell customers is when you buy your discus, you don't want to overcrowd them. The rule of thumb is minimum size tank, 55 gallons, and the sky's the limit after that. But what you need to do is you need to follow the rule of thumb as one discus for every 10 gallons of water. If you can stay within those parameters, the only thing you have to do is maybe one 20% water change weekly where you come in with uh, one of those siphoning tubes and siphon the gravel extremely well, get all that une uneaten food and fecal matter out, replace the water, and you're done. Basically, once a week, you got to devote one day. If you can follow that, the discus will grow, they'll thrive, there'll be no high bacteria levels, everything will be perfect. Discus do require a high-protein diet. So lately, the food of choice by everybody is the California blackworms, the live ones problem with that is once you get them eating live foods, then they're finicky and they'll only eat the live foods. You won't be able to get them to eat anything else. So here at home, what I try to do is I try to uh, sort the uh, different types of feeds. I'll give them a pellet food, uh, which is readily available for discus by many manufacturers. Tetra, Hikari, High Fang, Wardley's, they all make a discus-oriented food high in protein. And I feed them that in the morning, which is when they're most hungry. In the afternoon, I might hit them with beef heart, which is a formula that we make up ourselves, which is nothing more than beef heart, spinach, raw garlic, krill meal to hold everything together, and multivitamins. We make a paste out of that. We freeze it, and that's what we usually hit them with. And then the last feeding of the day would be the black worms. And once you get them used to a varied diet, if you ever run out of anything, you know that they're going to eat whatever else you have. If you're only feeding them black worms and that particular week the black worms don't come in from California, well, then you're the, spending the entire week crying because your fish won't touch anything else. It sounds like you've got a lot of good nutrition there as well, and I would think the black worms may not have everything that they need to. Without a doubt. The, the nice thing about the black worms is that they stimulate, and, and people right. see fish eating crazily, and they think that that's the healthiest they could be at. 
right. you know, uh, which, whichever way. If discus are eating, if discus are thriving, things are going well, people are happy. So in terms of, um, I guess, bottom line, temperature is most important, having good water quality and taking all the, all the detritus and things off the bottom, and then uh, the diet, and you think that really is kind of the basics for uh, keeping discus healthy. Yeah, that, that would be the basics. Now, if you follow those rules and only keep discus, that's great. But it's when people try to start doing more things, like adding tank mates. You know, you want to add tank mates, you can. You can add cardinal tetras, you can add neon tetras, you can add rominose tetras, you can add quarries, and non-aggressive fish. A lot of people try to experiment. They'll start adding African cichlids. They'll start adding, for example, uh, placosomas. And you know that 90% of the placosomas, actually 100% of the placosomas are nocturnal. And 95% of them, I think, are carnivorous. So can you imagine when your discus is sleeping at night with those placosomas running around? And next day you wake up and Zorro attacked. Your discus are slashed, marked, and everything, and you don't know where it came from. Those are the problems that most hobbyists run along, is that they put the wrong fish in with, with the discus, and the discus just can't compete or can't keep up. These are non-aggressive fish to a point. We'll get into that later if you like, because I have been receiving a lot of calls lately from customers who call me and say, I thought these were supposed to be the most peaceful fish on earth. I went and spent $200 on cardinal tetras, and I woke up in the morning and all the cardinals were gone. Yeah, I was going to say, we, uh, that's interesting because our, our uh, mutual friend, and we have to definitely say yeah. hi to Dan Rothen out there uh, who got me and you uh, hooked up for this it. interview. Um, he, yeah, he, uh, he, I think, had the problem with the plecos and the tetras, right? His yes. fish got eaten. Yes, absolutely. And it's what, what I try to tell people is if you're going to set up some kind of biotope with a bunch of other fish, what you want to do is you want to put your plants in first, you want to put your smaller fish, your school fish in afterwards, and the last guys you want to introduce are the discus. And the reason for that being is once the discus fall into the tank and see their surroundings, they automatically accept their surroundings as they are. If you put the discus in there first, and some of these discus will get up to eight or nine inches, and you come with a bag full of cardinals, basically what you're telling them is, hey, guys, here's some food for you. <laughs> because you're not used to seeing those cardinals. And, and you know, it's funny, Roy. I have uh, my 125 here still where it all started. I still have the original tank. It's a planted tank, and it's extremely loaded. I have uh, 13 Marlboro Reds in there. I've got 13 Clown Loaches. Don't ask me why the number 13. They just came up with that. <laughs> yeah. 200 Cardinal Tetras, 200 Rummy Nose Tetras, 50 Bleeding Heart Tetras, and a friend of mine who gets these uh, wild fish in from, uh, from the Amazon, he's, got a, um, he's like a trans shipper here, ornamental fish, Michael Rembrandt. Uh, for Christmas, he decided to give me 25 little hatchet fish because he felt that I needed a little exposure on the top of the tank. So I brought my little hatchet fish home and I put them in the tank, figuring there's so many other school fish, nobody's going to bother them. Roy, I saw one of my discus do something that blew me out of the water. Remember, these fish are round and flat. Wow. The, the hatchet fish are across the top of the tank. If he goes in head first, half his body will come out of the water. So I'm standing in front of the tank looking at everything that's going on, and he's the biggest marble right in there. He's about seven inches. He came to the top of the tank and literally went sideways to chase one of them sideways across the top of the tank. That's awesome. Did you get a video? No. And I <laughs> stood there like a moron with my phone in my hand saying to myself, this could have been perfect. Yeah. But just to give you an example, I thought that more school fish – they wouldn't be bothered. They, I mean, they're used to seeing so many other school fish. There must be 500 other fish in there. No, they knew the difference. And they said, you know what? These guys are not part of the system, and they're going to become food. Out of the 25, I think there's maybe 10 left. Wow, so some of them uh, were survivors. Yes, absolutely. So, so I wanted to touch a little bit on uh, breeding because it's, it's really fascinating for uh, folks that aren't aware of some of the things that the discus do in, you know, right. in terms of breeding and, and raising their, their young. Can you... Uh, Explain, I guess, how you, you, know, how you set up your pairs and you yeah. know, just give so us a little, all, a little bit of... Uh, yeah. First of all, I'm going to tell you that there are two species in the wild that have this capability. Discus are one of them and the Uarus are the others. And that capability is that when the discus breed, the offspring literally attach themselves to their body or swim around their body. They produce a mucus, a body slime, which feeds them. And there's only two species, them and the Uarus, that do this. And that's what makes them extremely interesting because wherever the discus go, they're covered by 100 or 200 babies at a time, uh, which is an amazing sight to see. And even more amazing than that is how they pass them off to each other. 
which is uh, very simple. One fish will just stand there, and the other one will come up swimming very slowly with the fry all over them. And at the very last minute, they'll just make a U-turn really fast, and all the fry will just jump onto the other parent. Very, very interesting. But to do that, to achieve that, uh, like I said at the very beginning of the conversation, costs a lot of money, and there's a lot of uh, things involved. And the things that are involved is that unless you use reverse osmosis water, very, very soft, non-mineral water, the eggs will never hatch. Or you'll get very small amounts of eggs hatching. So what we do is we breed between 80 and 120 microsiemens. I mean, to give you an example, Miami uh, water out of the tap has 275 microsiemens. Okay. So we, uh, we go through reverse osmosis, reconstitute it a little, and, uh, and that's the water that we use. We keep them a little bit lower than the 84. We find that when they're around 82 degrees, 83 degrees, it mimics like the Amazon River's uh, wet season where it's okay. raining, it's a little cooler, and that's what stimulates them to, to start spawning. During the first three days, in other words, they'll lay eggs. Uh, the eggs will hatch three days later. They'll stay stuck on whatever it is, on the glass, on a cone, on a slate, for another three or four days until they become free swimming. During the first three to four days of free swimming that they're on the sides of the parents, I don't feed other than the parents. In other words, I'll feed the parents the beef heart or whatever it is, but I don't go after the fry at all. It's on the fifth or sixth day that I start introducing uh, Artemia, live brine shrimp, uh, freshly hatched, and that's what they'll eat for about a week. And then after about 10 days of being on the sides of the parents, you start to notice that they break away from the parents whenever I feed the parents, and a few will start going down and literally start nibbling on the beef heart, which is nothing more than a paste. So they'll be able to nibble little pieces off of that. Three to four to five days later, every day you walk into that same tank, you start to notice that more and more are leaving the sides of the parents to go down and eat until finally one day you walk in and they're all looking at you like waiting to be fed like regular discus. When that point comes, we separate the breeding pairs out, and I usually leave the babies in there. I don't like to move them around because... uh, when you move them around, they're very fragile at that stage. And not only that, they stop eating for some reason. They, like, panic and stop eating. So we leave them by themselves there for about a month until they get about the size of a nickel, maybe a little bit bigger. And then that's when I transport them to a bigger tank where I can, you know, grow them out or put them together with a group in the same size. Okay. So, yeah, it, sounds, yeah. it does, definitely sounds complicated. And, you know, the water quality sounds like it's going to be obviously a lot more... Uh, well, particular for breeding so that's the thing yeah right. because you can grab a glass of ro water and you can grab a glass of city water and to the naked eye they look identical they probably even taste identical right. uh the problem is the mineral content is much different in one than it is in the other and so now you're talking about meters reverse osmosis and another thing uh they're not going to be able to produce any fry if they're in a community tank Right. I can tell you that right now because those cardinal tetras will gang up on them and eat every single egg. Right, that makes sense. They're definitely fascinating, and I've I've always loved watching yeah. discus. And when I found out about how they take care of the young, that was just fascinating. I wanted yeah. to kind of go back, um, and I know you, we had talked a little bit earlier a couple of days ago. I know you had some great Jack Wiley stories. Can you share maybe one or two of the Jack Wiley stories with us? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's times, you know, when you get frustrated, uh, you know, you get 10 orders or 12 orders going on on the same day and you're running around like a chicken without a head. And I remember every once in a while just losing it and calling Jack and saying to him, hey, Jack, you know what? I I don't know how the heck I'm going to do this today. I I don't think I have enough time to meet the uh, deadlines for the airlines and the whole nine yards and this and that and, and this and that. And he would try to calm me down and say to me, Gabriel, remember when I used to do it and I did it from my uh, one car garage? He said, I'm going to tell you stories. Not everything was perfect, even though I'm supposed to be the most renowned discus breeder in the world. You know, I had one time, and, and, and he would go through many, many stories, but this one particular story was just one that we both laugh to this day. He had a woman from Hawaii call him up and order six discus from him. And so back then, he would use those full-size bags rather than the way we ship out now, which is every fish is individual. So he would line up his bag inside, which had the perfect flat bottom it would fit inside the little styrofoam boxes fill that up with water he would take the discus he would put them in there oxygenate close the bag and ship it out well that particular day he had about eight orders and uh, he was running through to make the deadlines for the airlines and uh, shipped everything out everything went perfect you know went home that night slept well next morning gets a phone call from the woman frantic at the other end telling him that somebody had stolen her discus (laughs) so jack is trying to gather information and say uh the box never made it. 
And she was like, no, 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 no. The box made it. The box made it. But when I opened up the box, the only thing that was inside the box was water. The discus were gone. Somebody stole the discus in transit. And so he says, stole the discus? That's impossible, impossible. So he walked into the fish room, and lo and behold, there in a quarantine tank were the woman's six discus. He had six discus <laughs> in the box. <laughs> and, and, and until this day, we laugh about that. And you know what? It cheers me up when I'm down in the dumps and I'm working my rear end off and I don't think that I'm going to meet my quota. I think about that day, that what happened with Jack, and it just makes it more human. And you say to yourself, you do what you can. And what you can, you explain to people, hey, listen, we're not going to be able to get your fish out today because of whatever. And most people are very understanding. And that happened to me uh, back on September 11th. Back on September 11th, I had nine orders going out that day. And you remember, when the towers came down, all flights were canceled for like three days. There was no flights in the air. And I remember that I picked up the phone and I called each and every one of the customers and I told them I'm going to return your money because I don't know where this is going to go and I don't know when I'm going to be able to get the fish out to you. And I remember that, uh, you know, to this day I still get misty because people were telling me you will do no such thing. You will keep the money and whenever you can get the fish out to us, you send them out to us. And that was pretty amazing on its own. Yeah, that is. You know? So that, that's one story that hit home. Yeah. So you've been doing an incredible job. And I know, uh, especially talking with my friend, our, our mutual friend, Dan, uh, you are uh, keeping the, uh, the Jack Watley line and name uh, you know, really out there and really appreciate all the work you've been doing. The, the bottom line is this is a hobby for me. Okay? This is not work. So whenever I have a hobby, be it whatever it is, the hobby becomes interesting when you can enjoy it and when there are other people who enjoy it with you and have the same taste as you do. So when people call me up and tell me, hey, you know, I got this from somebody else, but I'm having problems, and who I bought them from doesn't want to give me any advice, and I don't know what to do, can you help me out? I put myself in their shoes, and I say to myself, boy, if I was in a hobby spending my money to try to enjoy and relax myself, and I'm going through all these problems, I'd be very frustrated. So I take the time the same way I'm talking to you and enjoying it, you can tell that I'm actually enjoying telling you these stories, to talk to them and try to get them out of a jam. Do this, do that, change this, medicate with this, try doing that. And the next thing you know, those people calling you up desperate for help are suddenly your future customers. Because in the sense. long run, Roy, yeah. what's going to happen is they're going to say to themselves, well, do I go back to the guy that sold me the fish and then would, would not help me? Or do I go back to Gabe, who took his time to at least talk to me? And, you know, when you run your business like a hobby or when you run anything in your life that way, you're going to be successful. Exactly. You feel good about it, too. And uh, it is a good thing. It's the right thing to do. So I yeah. really appreciate that. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I really want to thank our guest, Gabe Posada, and our producer, Mark Winter, for making this show possible. So, Gabe, did you have any final words or information or wisdom you want to give to our listeners? Absolutely. If you're in doubt, be it discus or be it whatever it is you want to get into, try to always find a way to call an actual breeder and get all the correct information. Don't go to a local pet shop and expect to get everything that you're going to need for that specific strain or species or whatever fish it is that you want. Try to look on Google, see who's breeding them, whether it's cardinals, whether it's Africans, whatever it is, go directly to the source. They're going to give you specific information on that fish, not general information, which usually guides you uh, the wrong way. And that would be my suggestion. Be it discus, be it whatever. Get the proper information from the breeders or the people that specialize in those fish, and you'll never go wrong. That's great advice, Gabe. Thanks a lot. And I'm, I'm definitely going to be uh, talking with you more uh, in the future, so I appreciate that. Definitely. I look forward to it. We'll get into more details about the newer strains, and maybe we can post some pictures of the crazy stuff that's being available right now with discus. Exactly, exactly. Thanks for joining us. Please. My pleasure, Roy. Thank you for calling me. It was a pleasure meeting you. I'm going to have to go up and visit you guys soon. Yeah, definitely. Definitely come over and uh, you'll, you'll uh, have some fun with the fish we got at the lab. Absolutely. So, so please be sure to check out Gabe's webpage on Aquarium Mania. We'll have uh, the link to their Facebook page as well as their uh, Jack Watley Discus website. I encourage all of you to visit my Aquarium Mania blog on Pet Life Radio. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for a show, email me at drroy at petliferadio.com. That's D-R-R-O-Y at petliferadio.com. If you're ever in Florida, please be sure to visit the Aquarium Mania exhibit at the Florida Aquarium in Tampa. And also check out my new book, An Animal Life, a humorous novel written by me and my veterinary classmates and inspired by our time at vet school. For more information, go to aninimallife.com. Until next time, please visit your local aquarium stores, Keep your tanks clean and your fish healthy, and think about keeping discus the key.
king of aquarium fish. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.